David Parkin has been involved in football at AFL level as a player, coach and commentator for more than half a century. He remains a frontline participant as a commentator, still captivated by the game, still passionate about all things football. Welcome to Open Mic, David, and I've got a feeling you don't want to be here. I'm a reluctant participant. Why is that? I don't think that I'm the kind of person that has much to uh, get excited about uh, what happened in the past and what's happening now or what might happen in the future. So I'm, I'm a little reluctant. Ours has been, uh, I guess, a um, not so much a love-hate, but maybe a hate-love relationship, Michael. That bad? Well, you understand the... Uh, period when you were working hard at your previous job and uh, I was trying to work hard at mine and I didn't think either role was terribly compatible. <laughs> <laughs> no, I accept that, I accept that. I don't know if you've had time to notice, but you turned 70 in September. Isn't it about time you did something productive with your life? That's a joke, Parker. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, no, I mean, but it, yeah, time, what, what has happened though, Michael, is time, as everybody says, at <clears throat> my age, the, uh, the decades go faster each decade. 30 to 40 was you know, moving steadily along and then 40 to 50 started to gallop again. 50 to 60 it went overnight and I can't remember where the 60 to mm. 70 uh, has gone. So, And I've been filling it as often and as hard as I possibly can in all elements of my life. And uh, one of those privileged people, Michael, that's been able to pursue the things that uh, I love and have a passion for and hopefully making a difference in uh, for the last uh, 50 years. You played 211 games for the Hawks and you coached three clubs for a total of 518 games. That's the sixth highest total ever, yet you're so self-effacing about your contribution to football. Why so? Oh, no, self-effacing. No, I, I love playing, Michael, like most people, and without doubt my most satisfying football moment was to captain a premiership in 1971. As a coach, I'm very honest about where I was. I took Hawthorne over in 1977 when John Kennedy could not continue, and I took over a premiership team that had won in 76. We won again in 78 with the same talent. I didn't have to do too much. It's been a lifelong love affair with the game for you, hasn't it? I know you, I was amazed you were telling me recently about how many grand finals you've seen. It goes back to 1949. 1949. Yeah, I had a, yeah. Had a father who was a member, the MCC member, mm -hmm. and I used to go on the, uh, the, uh, the ladies' tickets allowed children to go in, and, and I went to every grand final. My dad had a great love of the game too. Fortunately, that was passed on to me, so we went... Every year, and I have had the privilege of not missing one, including the uh, the replays, Michael, so that would be a record that very few people could beat. It is, no doubt about that. Now, my memory of you, I saw you play. <coughs> my memory of you uh, uh, was brave, always kept his eyes on the footy. I remember you as a back pocket player, but you were concussed every second week. That's probably a slight exaggeration. No, no, but I had 12, Michael, and I had, you know, I had some... I, I was concussed in my 50th, my 100th, my 150th and 200th. It's not bad, isn't it? That's pretty consistent. So did you have a glass jaw? Or was yeah, I had it? a glass jaw, yeah. No, not round the head, but on the jaw. And I remember going out the first time in the amateurs. I went to market ball on a wet day, it hit me on the jaw. I woke up and I started to run for the ball and they were having a shot for goal at the other end. That was the first of 12. The last one being when I coached Subiaco and I was knocked out at Claremont in the first five minutes. I woke up at four o'clock on Sunday morning, which was... 26 hours later, wow. and I retired on the back of that one. You walk away from Hawthorne. Carlton has finished on top of the home and away ladder in 1980 and been eliminated with two losses in its two finals. What happened from there? When I was offered the job and was difficult in those circumstances, I think Peter Jones was pretty much offended and, uh, and it was a, a difficult and ongoing relationship with him because he never would talk to me as David. It was always the Hawthorne, the Hawthorne bloke. bloke. You, you mm. the Hawthorne bloke. And uh, for me... It was a godsend in that the team was talented. We made them work a bit harder defensively, I think. Uh, we put a few rules into place. We were in a pretty good place with resources as Carlton when I compare where I'd come mm. from. And we got every opportunity, Michael, to, to do the job. And, and uh, while we struggled the second year round, when I took the foot off the accelerator halfway through 82, and we lost our way a bit, the momentum we had, I think we were belted by... Richmond in the second semi-final, maybe by four or five goals. We were lucky to get up against Hawthorne at Waverley a week later. Yep. And then I think we had the advantage of knowing what Richmond were going to and do and how they were going to structure. Richmond, didn't you? And we, we, we literally didn't, we didn't. Well, we they physically got into us. I mean, that's a classical story of 
my probably most ashamed moment in football that I had a sense when we were going down the race that it might be the Richmond mentality, as we called it. So I stopped <laughs> the players on the way down to the ground. So they're, they're ready, they're assembled and ready to run out the race? Concertinaed in the, in the race, they did. And I said, just a quick reminder, if one of our small blokes goes down and there's every chance that that will happen today, so that wasn't a smart thing to say to all the, the seven or eight little <laughs> blokes are running around waiting where it was coming from. I said, when it happens, I said, I want you to turn around and knock the bloke out standing next to you. When he wakes up and says, what was that for? You say, that was for my little mate down the ground. Knock the bloke out next to you. Yeah. You said that. Shame to admit it, but I did. And uh, it happened. We kicked, you might remember, we kicked, I think, three goals. One before Richmond even got the ball. So we're flying. In fact, was the difference at the end of the game, Michael. I think mm -hmm. three goals. One was about the winning margin. And the big Mark Lee uh, knocked over Alex Marcoux over there in Bay 16. So I immediately looked to see who were the coachable people in the team. Mm -hmm. And I looked at the back half because everybody ran to the blue, except the six backmen who were locked at this end of the ground. Some great names, Dual Hunter and company. And um, it was Mari, Mario Bortolotto. And I buy him a meal every year on the he was, basis. Was he playing on David Cloak? He's playing on David Cloak. Yeah. He turned around and kinged him. Oh, Did he really? Really hit him. I, I can't believe when you're sitting here you're saying you're proud of that. No, I'm not proud. I said, no, you I'm said not. You said you buy him a meal every year. No, I'm, I'm thanking Mario because of, you know, he did. He was the most, it's the most coachable act I've seen a player do. A disgraceful act, but it was coachable because I asked him to do it. And he sat David Clay down. David was big enough to take the punch and sit on the ground. Then while he was sitting on the ground, he spoke. I couldn't see what he said, obviously. He spoke to Mario and I saw Mario's hand go out to say, that's for me little mm. mate down there. And I, look, I, I speak now, I speak about it openly now, it was a long while ago, but uh, Neil Craig said, have you ever cheated in a game? And uh, I told him that story and he, he reacted as you just reacted mm. there. Mm. So I'm not proud because of that. Because I know, because I know how, how important the essence of the game is to you. You know, that you, you care about its welfare and, and its future. I now, do. Coaching does that to you. Coaching does things to people that, uh, <laughs> and it does things to players as we're learning all the time that uh, the white line fever, the, the expectation of the moment brings about behaviour which you think might be, might be having too much to drink, you become the person that you really are, mm. but under those extremes you do and say things that you know you shouldn't and that cost you for the rest of your days. You lasted five years before one of the most bizarre events that I can remember in football. Fitzroy and Carlton swapped coaches. Walls went back to Carlton. Parkin went to Fitzroy. Was that, that couldn't have been by chance, was it? Oh, you know, totally by chance in the sense that I was appointed by Ian Collins and uh, John on the Monday. It might have been leading into grand final week. I think it happened. I was appointed and went about my work, including working with the reserves, who I think were playing on that day, to be pulled in on Thursday night. On the back of, I think, Robert resigning from Fitzroy, that was the first of the, the catalyst for it mm -hmm. to happen. I think they were genuinely appointing me because Robert wasn't available. And the moment he became available, I was brought in and told by uh, Ian and John that uh, it was all over. Now, I didn't, I actually took it more calmly than I can ever believe I did. And I looked at them, shrugged my shoulders and walked to the door. He let me get to the door, John. He said, Parker, I wouldn't be worried about it too much. He said, I'll be ringing you up sometime <laughs> down the track because you in the future will be the right bloke to coach this club again. I won't say what I said to him then, but it was similar to the words that he used. Um, and it actually did happen. Came so to pass, yeah. It came to yeah. pass. But yeah. then on the back of that, Fitzroy came to me to, to interview me and I probably had a, enough at that stage really balked and they were saying, oh, well, we're not sure you're the right bloke. I said, well, you better make up your mind mm. because I've got to think about whether I want to do the job, not whether you want me. So uh, you better go away and think about that. Well, they came back and offered me the job and, and I took it on. And, and to be truthful, uh, Michael, it's 1986 mm. and how lucky I was in a sense that I was on the back end of one of the best group of players <coughs> I've ever had the privilege to work with. You coached well in 86. The, the, the industry says that might have well been your best year well, of coaching. Well, I, I, I probably would agree with that. From inwardly as well, we had to win, Michael, I think three or four on the run home to make it. And we won them all by less than two kicks. So we struggled to get there. I think the first semi-final we went to Waverley and we played Essendon out there in that. the wet, wet day. Yeah. Wet day, and Michael Conlon hadn't done anything for the day, swung in off his right foot on the boundary line. Uh, and kick 
one of those incredibly difficult, impossible goals and we get home by a point. It was just a, a wonderful finish and we're through that and we're, we're still alive, you know, and then we had to play Hawthorne the next week. And I will never forget this on the basis that um, R- Ruzi was injured and he was injured, had a really bad ankle and couldn't play, so he'd been ruled out. When I got to the game, probably an hour before, they were all sitting around in their civvies almost resigned to the fact that you know there was no urgency no excitement uh that they couldn't do the job they don't they give it their best shot it was all over and ruzi give me the day and very few people would know this ruzi sensed and felt what i did as coach he came out to me and he said i'll go and see the doc i think i might get filled with local and i'll be right to play well he went in had the injections walked out of the medical room nodding his head to me he was all right with a limp (laughs) <laughs> so we still were there. And the place realised he was going out to play. They were all wa- hovering around the door and watching for the same result. And I, I lifted in spirit. They all jumped into their gear. We went out. And you won't remember this, except Grant Laurie. And Grant Laurie was the bloke who I had to go and tell wasn't playing. Oh, It was, was one of the more difficult things. And he still talks to me today. So he was, it was he dressed and ready to go? Ready to play. Yeah. And we made the change at the last minute. And he missed out on the opportunity to play. And that was... I get, up, I get emotional about that. that. That was one of the more difficult decisions mm. that I've made. But right away we went, and I think we kicked a bit like the start of the grand final in 82. I think we kicked three goals, one, be, before Hawthorne had touched the ball. And Ken Herbert grabbed me and said, we're, we're going to do it again, he said. Mm. He wasn't actually right. They kicked the next 13 goals, I think, and we, <laughs> and we got very badly rolled. Your first year at Fitzroy was third place, and then it was two lowly finishes. Did you? There was a suggestion at the time that you had quote lost the players. Yeah, no, that, that's a. I had. Uh, we got to about round eleven. I think if you look in eighty seven, we were flying. We'd beaten everybody who finished in finals, etc. On the way, well, I put it on the players, and uh, we lifted the expectation. I think we hardly won another game from mm. that time, Michael. And the, and the worse we got, the harder I went. Mm. And, You're and in a verbal sense. In a verbal sense. Yeah. And by the end yeah. of 87, and this is probably an interesting point, end of 87, totally lost the group. They rightfully were trying to manipulate me out the door. On the back of that, very few people know I was given the job, offered and accepted the job to coach West Coast at the oh, end really? of 87, which few people would know, in my house at Templestowe. And even the family were you know, reasonably happy to go at that stage. So it was and a done deal? It was a done deal, yeah, done deal. And, uh, and I slept on it over the night and I woke up the next morning still with a year of my contract to Fitzroy. And the worst decision that I've made in football, I think, um, was to ring them up and say, I'm obligated to the contract which I have and I need to mm. see the contract out at the Fitzroy Football Club. And that led to the worst year of mm. my life, mm. without doubt, the worst year of my life. I went under as a person, I think mentally, uh, socially, physically. Uh, it was a really tough time and a bad decision that I wasn't encouraged to go by the club and a worse decision by me not to read the situation. And by the time we finished in 88, it was a basket case, mm-hmm. the whole place. So had, had the contract expired... Um, the at, year before? The time, yeah, you would have definitely gone to West Coast? Absolutely. Mm. Yeah. And there were no caveats on it? It was a done deal? No, no, we done want deal. you to coach? Yes, yeah. I, I'd love to. They came to my place at, and asked me, and, uh, and I, they wouldn't go until I said yes. Let's go to 1991. Two men named John Elliott and Ian Collins, they'd sacked you from Carlton. They came a-calling again and got you back to the Blues for 10 years. Did you, did the, I suppose the pride in you make you a bit reluctant to take that job or not? Or was that just... No, 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 no. I was, uh, he was... He was to his word. He did come back. And uh, I can remember going to Two Towers Avenue, Turak, mm-hmm. for the first meeting when I went A over T down the driveway in my <laughs> shoes and cut my head open. Didn't get any... Uh, this is to John's place. To yeah, John's place, yeah. yeah. It took a while to get through the security and uh, <laughs> knocked, yeah. knocked myself out going down the driveway. The, the girl came out and gave me a mouth to mouth, so I recovered pretty quickly. <laughs> um, it, was, it was fascinating to walk through the door and what do you want to know was the first question. That's usually the last question in the interview. I said, how good are you? Well, we're not too good. That group of uh, players that you coached, you'll have to get rid of all them because they're all finished mm-hmm. and maybe start again. I said, oh, that's interesting. 
I really enjoy getting rid of all them. <laughs> uh, I said, um, that means it's a, uh, a rebuild. We're talking about a rebuild here. Oh, we don't rebuild here, but it's a massive renovation, he said. <laughs> and so I said, well, you know, how, how, t- how long is it going to take? He said, probably three years at the minimum, four, could even take you five years. Now, this is John Elliott talking about the rebuilding of Carlton in 91. And he was right. We actually got there in 93 and got cleaned yep. up. Incident, really bad loss. Got worse the year after when I probably should have lost my job because we lost to Geelong and Melbourne. Geelong particularly had lost their best forward players in that final, so we went There's out the of the game. Yeah. the game. And because I think I'm absolutely certain, I've never asked them straight out, but I think Jared Healy, uh, um, Dermot, Dermot Burton, Burton yep. and one other, uh, I think... Um, Knocked him back. Jared Healy, I said Jared Healy, Dermot yep. Brereton and uh, Gary Lyon were the three that were given the opportunity to coach Carlton in 95 and for whatever reason, I've never had that conversation, might, might, might in my old age actually have it, the three knocked it back. So I actually held the job. But So you're, the, you're saying that, that you would have lost that role? Uh, pre-1995, had any one of those three said they wanted to coach Carlton? That is my understanding, and I haven't had it confirmed by anybody other than a close person at Carlton, but I haven't spoken to those three players. So, yeah, I think that, that was an absolute real mm. possibility. When we come back, I want to talk about your notorious relationship with the fourth estate, the media. You were famous for your animated addresses at quarter time and half time and the anguish you showed in the coach's box. Was that just spontaneous, just just occurred? Did you try to not to do it? No, no, it was just, I think that was me. People who know me, um, I have these dreadful highs and lows, I suppose, in my uh, communication with people. When I am passionate about things, uh, I want to deliver that as, as a meaningful way of expressing how I feel. And the play, you know, players are on the end of some pretty vitriolic stuff. Mm-hmm. And... Um, once I'd set that pattern, I think if I'd spoken in very controlled ways, the message might have got through with the same effect. So are you saying that it was a little bit contrived? A little bit contrived, yeah. Was it? But yeah. uh, an expectation that on occasions it came out because I felt that way and delivered it, and then there was an expectation that if it was meaningful and he was passionate and he really meant it, you'd be on the end of some spit and a vein. Well, I was. We saw it. The media saw it. You, you were responsible for the term the fifth quarter? which is when the coaches address the media after a game, you brought that same passion and anger at times to that. I think the word you used was venom. Venom, yeah, yeah. Yeah, look, I, I didn't have much time for you or, um, or your mates. Me personally. No, yeah. I didn't say you personally, but I didn't have much time for you. You know how plur- sensitive I am. You, or plur- you plural. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah. and I, I couldn't over the years, and it got less and less receptive in a sense, I couldn't see what benefit the media were, and this was a stupidity. Uh, Now I look back and am part of the media. Now that you're in the media. Now I'm in the media. Um, I just couldn't see what benefit there was to anybody, me in particular, selfishly, or my team or club, by offering you know, information post-match, pre-match or whatever else. So you got little out of me except, hang on, I know that they used to toss the coin outside the room to see who was going to ask the first yeah. question and get the head bit off. I didn't know that until later. Yeah, that's true. And I, I did take offence a lot. I took offence at things that you wrote too and didn't have much time for you for a long time until I actually got out of the business, could think a little more clearly and actually get to know. And I've got four or five people now in the media who I would claim as my really good friends that I enjoy their company, I understand what they're doing and the, and the work, and I understand now from the other side how important it is to the game. I'll tell you how serious it was from my perspective. I remember you and I go to a barbecue twice a year at Shane O'Sullivan's house uh, with assorted other people, including Mark McClure. And I remember ringing once and Shane invited me. I said, is Parkin going? And he said, uh, yes. And I found out later that you'd made the same phone call. Is Sheehan going? Is that right? And there were two, there were two empty seats. <laughs> four, four empty seats. The women couldn't go. The women couldn't go either, so four of us didn't go. I, I, actually, I think that's a very true story. We were of the view, even though you, you thought, I think you almost sort of thought there were parasites in the game. I reckon that's, I'd never used the word, but I think it was an appropriate way to how you viewed us. define my thinking. Yeah, and yet the view we had was, we love this game as much, I love the game as much as you do. 
we just have different roles in it. And I know that now. Okay. I'm, 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 I'm public, okay. publicly apologising. Right. It was the way I did it, and I yep. I can't say that I changed. Even when I at the finish, I was coming, and we had the, we had a blue over that because uh, one article you wrote really really. Um, you thought hurt I, me. I probably think it did demean you. Actually, I'll say that now. Well, that it was an article. People, you know, it was an article that suggested that I'd been sacked or was about to be rolled out the door, and I'd spent from 1998, 1992. I'd spent basically those three years trying to put in a well thought through. Mm. And you can argue debate about that afterwards. Well through thought through succession plan. I'd found an interesting story in itself because. I'm not sure, it was 99, I can't remember the years, 99 maybe, I had appointed Ross Lyon in my house in Hawthorne at about 10 o'clock in the morning and very pleased that he was the bloke that I needed at the time, having coached Ross at Fitzroy, understanding his think his mentality, very sharp bloke and what he had to give, so I appointed him. Went into the football club late that afternoon as John Elliott and Stephen Goff arrived from Perth just to tell me that they've appointed... Uh, John Warsfold as my assistant for next year. So it turned out that we ended up having two coaches and both have remained very good <laughs> friends and I'm delighted that both are good coaches. Choices, Parker. Both, both are yeah. coaching at the uh, both are coaching pretty well at AFL level. But that was a pretty embarrassing moment. So we ended up with two coaches. Maybe mm. that's why Carlton are uh, was it thirteen million dollars in debt or whatever <laughs> they are. Carlton! Carlton is into the grand final. Nineteen ninety nine. Did you play your grand final in the preliminary final that year? Oh, no doubt about it. We just played at the finish. They didn't kick what they should have kicked in the third quarter and left the door open. The team did stand up and it struggled. It got itself going. Half a dozen players who'd contributed minimal became good players and Kudafis probably played the game of his life and we were able to get over the line. And look, quite rightly, the two best teams would have been Essendon and North Melbourne. We happened to be third best and we'd played it. But uh, it's remembered by me and yeah. it's remembered by Carlton people as much as any premiership they've ever won. Parker, your anger's famous and sometimes the final siren didn't bring an end to it. There's a mysterious incident, as bizarre as it sounds, there's thousands of people, tens of thousands of people at the MCG. You were in an altercation with a spectator. Are you prepared to tell us what actually happened that day? Oh, Michael, it was, uh, it, yeah, it was an Essendon, suppose, an Essendon game, and I'm... Um, you were in, walking along the yeah, boundary? Yeah, I had my yeah. arm round Wayne. I think we'd had a loss, and uh, I was talking to him going up the race. The bloke came over the edge. I thought he was going to clock us or do something. And so I, uh, my inclination was to uh, throw a punch, which I did. It landed, didn't it? It did land, yeah. Mm. And I'm, I'm very... That was a bad moment and uh, and I should have been and I was in fact the man that night at Millgate thank goodness the person in charge was Michael Reeves he the was Fitzroy there Fitzroy footballer and policeman my ex uh, Fitzroy play happened yeah. to be helping out a mate of his who was having his 40th birthday he was on on duty and the uh, man came in and uh, wanted to press charges for the assault and uh, Michael didn't know and hadn't heard and convinced the man that he should go away and think about it, come back the next morning if he was still there. And he came back and, and I'm very thankful, asked for a, uh, an apology. So um, I was very happy to Which you that. delivered. So you did actually make contact with your fist to his mouth? Did you not cut your... Uh... <laughs> See, the word has got around there. I <laughs> end up with three stitches in my hand. Yeah. Actually, you ran into that bloke later on, didn't you? Yeah, you heard the story, right? Um, he, he was involved in footy, which yeah. is quite sad. He was a junior coach and uh, I was doing, as I so often do, a coach's course somewhere and he came up and introduced himself to me. So He said, do you recognise these teeth? <laughs> <laughs> you dislodged one of them. And he was very decent about it, so I, uh, I'm thankful for that. I think you, no doubt you were the first coach to introduce detailed reviews of player games. Now, how extensive were they and, and, and did they work? Well, I'm not sure. It, it probably took away from me spending more time face to face with players by writing it but I, I would think no player ever played a game for me and I've kept every one of those all the way through would have got there in retrospect would have had a lot about the team would have the statistical analysis and the stuff that we're delivering against them but it also would have had a comment about their specific game and a rating they all would have had that all the way through so if I didn't if I didn't <coughs> get uh, if I didn't get to them then they could always read it and they would know where they stood in terms of that game took my life away from me yeah. in a real sense because I end up, people won't believe this, but I end up working, you know, um, 
credible hours and, and sleeping four or five hours a day for about 20 odd years. And I don't think that helped me health wise or, or, or relationship wise, those sort of things. I don't think it does when you get so committed to that, that the time you should be spending with family and particularly children. Um, I owe my kids, a, uh, you know, a gratitude and a, and a real debt in a sense. Thank goodness through their grandkids, Michael, <laughs> we know grandfathers. Yep. Yeah, I've actually got a relationship with my son and daughter for the first time in my life, and uh, that's a sad thing to admit. Terrible father, but I'm trying to be a very. You good are grandfather. you are traditionally hard on yourself in that. Do you literally mean you've got you've got a guilt? Yeah, no, I do. About, oh, yeah, about yeah. family and uh, and the inability as a husband and uh, father to do the things that I needed to do. Uh, so yeah, I, I have carried that. That's the one regret I guess I have. More recently, you came face to face with your mortality, March 2009. Your prostate gland is removed, prostate cancer. What effect did that have on your life? A, a massive effect, Michael, because I'd had a father and grandfather who'd, um, who died of it, not with it. And I saw two very painful deaths. Mm -hmm. And I guess, uh, you know, it's like us all, you get older, I'm, as you say, nearly 70, and uh, your own mortality looms up. So it was a it was a tough time to, and people who face that uh, you know, know that diagnosing it, knowing whether you're going to do active surveillance or get treatment, and if you're going to get treatment, which treatment do you get? I mean, there's a lot of unknowns in this area, which we're working very hard now to raise awareness and certainly raise the money to do the research to find out. Um, it, it was one of the more difficult terms, but if you've got a wonderful family and partner and and uh, and was able to get through it, and I'm as well now. Three years later, you can say that the uh, the PSA test is suggesting there are no prostate, uh, um, yes, whatever they are, the cancer in, in your blood and uh, you should be free. So I'm living a normal life now. Now we've had our moments over the journey, but you've made a massive contribution to football and something that I've never done. I've always been happy to acknowledge. Uh, on many fronts, you should be proud of that and congratulations and good luck for the future. Thanks, Michael. And we are, despite what the viewers might think, we have become extremely good mates. <laughs> good on you, Parker. Thank you.